I want to welcome everybody to the beginning of our summer series of sessions. And uh, we're beginning with a very honored old friend and guest teacher today, Dr. Stephen Hickman. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, really looking forward to this. I'm so excited to see um, what two guys might mm -hmm might come up with within the dialogue of today's session. Um, I'd like to begin where we just left off. Um, you guided us for the past 20 minutes in meditation. And when I say us, that's the group of teachers that are gathered together here today on Zoom with us. Um, and you invited us to take a look at what the heart needs. And at the same time, to sit with what's here as it is, just as it is, like this. So I'm wondering, what's here? Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, the short answer is a lot. Mm -hmm. I think um, being here with this uh, remarkable group of people, some of my teachers, my friends, my colleagues, and strangers too, um, it's, uh, it's like coming home. And um, ah, a real reminder of uh, common humanity you know, I think we all, uh, for me, uh, I like to think of myself as very independent and, you know, uh, I don't know, all the things that go with independent, but I, I, uh, I am standing on the shoulders of lots of folks and lots of folks on my shoulders and that we're all connected and that uh, there's just something very comforting and soothing about being together. Um, so that's what's here. That's one thing that's here. Uh, you know, we practice what we, what we need and, um, that practice of affectionate breathing and tending to what's in the heart, um, was me tending to what's in my heart, which is a certain amount of heartbreak and sadness and grief and rage and anger over th events in the world and, uh, tragedy and death and all of that stuff and just naming that that's in the room for me and I suspect for most everyone here. So a fair amount of uh, woundedness and, um, and hope is here. So there you have it. <laughs> Thank you for naming it. I think it's so true, and it leads me to wonder within our work how, where, and even if at times when I'm a little disheartened by events in the world, um, if we're making a difference. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the big question, isn't it? Um, you know, we, in our, our reflective moments, we say we are engaged in, you know, helping to change the world, you know, one heart at a time uh, through mindfulness, compassion, whatever contemplative field or whatever endeavor. Um, and um, sometimes we're okay with that. And then when stuff happens, we're impatient. I am. And like, it, may, it doesn't feel like enough. Um, that's the that's the tension we live in. I think, you know, is this enough? And it is. And in this moment, it is enough. It is what is within our grasp. But it doesn't make it any less frustrating <laughs> sometimes um, to want to, you know, get up off the cushion and go out and do something whatever that something might be. Um, yeah, so I mean, without kind of 
going off the rails here in terms of philosophy and all. I do think there's something about this um, I think there's a lot, there's been a lot of focus in our field and mindfulness and MBSR in particular, MBCT on um, acceptance because holy cow, that's a, that's a simple word, but it's a big thing, right? And, um, and it's, it's been the focus of our collective attention for as long as any of us have been teaching mindfulness is to help people come to terms with things as they are so that they can work with them in a certain way. But it, um, but I think we're, as a field, I'm just kind of like taken off here a little bit, but um, as, a, as a field, as a, as a movement of sorts, um, we will always be teaching acceptance, but we're, but now is, maybe a time as mindfulness becomes more a part of daily life for more people, that there's also the, the twin of acceptance, room for that, which is action. Acceptance and action. There's the, you know, the serenity prayer, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. So we're talking about courage and the change. At least I think that's where we are. So that's where we can remember that it isn't just um, acceptance. It is acceptance and action, whatever that action may be, but at least thoughtful, intentional, mindful, compassionate action. So that's some comfort. Um, when I get impatient, is that there is some room for compassionate action, fierce compassion, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Now I'm just riffing off stuff, so I don't know if I. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's the invitation. Thanks for accepting it. <laughs> um, my father carried the serenity prayer in his wallet. And uh, probably many times had to look at it over me when I was a teenager. <laughs> um, but I love what you're speaking to um, because it's really action. Uh, another word that comes to mind is activism. Mm -hmm. You know, and when the activism comes out of a centered, mindful, self compassionate place, perhaps it's not as violent. Or it's held in a container that uh, it's presented in a way that might actually achieve something rather than create more othering or polarization. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, I noticed that you took some activist action writing. Is it a congressman in your district? Oh. Yeah. yeah, the two senators from. To Oregon, where I live. Mm -hmm. I'll speak towards that. Yeah, just um, uh, I mean, I don't, without delving too far into the specifics of this particular incident, to speaking more generally, but you know, anger was coming up for me, and outrage, and and this desire to act, and. Um, um, uh, and the need to not be complacent or to feel complacent in anything. You know, I, I, what I happened to say in this particular letter was that I have felt a bit complacent having lived in two states where all of my representatives saw, seemed to see the world more or less like me in the sense of a more liberal point of view, a more Democrat-focused agenda. It's not so much about which which agenda, but the, they aligned with me. So I felt like, well, they've got me covered. I'm just good. I, there's no point in me writing my congressman or complaining to them because they're, 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 they're following my agenda. And I just felt like uh, that complacence was not necessarily healthy because um, stuff isn't getting done. Things aren't changing. And so calling calling out people on my side, so to speak, to, to really ask themselves, what are you doing? 
Uh, anyway, uh, the point being, I felt moved to do something that was in some small way meaningful and, um, and, and to then not only to do that, but to share it publicly in social media so that other people commented and, um, and maybe were out, outraged or I tapped into something. And that, I think that's, that's the thing that we can do is to be a collective of sorts that when we talk about these things in this setting or on social media or wherever, that we tap into that common humanity that is like very comforting and soothing what I said earlier, but also can be, um, can take action, you know? Um, how do we get each other off of the cushion and out into the world and doing what needs to be done um, and to not accept everything, but to accept what we can or need to and have that courage to do something when something needs to be done. Um, yeah, I suspect that people in everyone's classes um, also, I mean, before we can even get into action is like, could we actually do what I did, name what's in the room when we're teaching and um, before we get too busy on the action side of things, um, acknowledge what's here and meet ourselves with a certain degree of kindness and acknowledge how friggin' hard it is sometimes, how painful it is for us as teachers and for everyone in the room. Um, I, um, I, have a, I have a transparency problem. <laughs> it's not really a problem. Uh, if you haven't already guessed, I tend to be pretty transparent about what's going on for me. And, uh, and I think that's true of when I'm teaching as well. I know it's true. Because I say stuff in class sometimes and my co-teacher looks at me like, wow. I think Alan looked at me a time or two like that, or 10 or 12 when we co-taught. Co -taught. Like, really? Did you just say that? Not, nothing crazy, but just the kind of stuff most people don't say out loud. But I think there is something about the transparency in teaching that when our heart is in pain, that to some degree we tap into that. Do we have to heal ourselves in front of the group? No, but do we acknowledge you know, that we are fellow human beings who ache and grieve and rage and worry um, if we don't, we undermine the message we're trying to convey, right? If we act as if we've got it all together and, uh, you know, once you practice mindfulness, you get to a certain point and then you're, uh, you know, you're good to go. Um, what good is that? We're setting people up for some sort of vision of perfection that doesn't actually exist and doesn't do anybody any favors. I think the naming of what's in the room what's in one's heart as a teacher is really powerful. Uh, I'll just tell you one quick story. It's not related to anything I've been saying so far, but one of our teachers of mindful self-compassion, a brand new teacher, a uh, very anxious person, very sweet, very well-intended, but very anxious, wanting a bit perfectionistic or maybe a lot perfectionistic. Um, when she uh, was getting ready to teach her very first MSc course, she was prepared to the nth degree. And Alan and I ch joke about preparation, um, which we don't tend to engage in a lot of it. Now, that's how we end up talking about what we're talking about right now. <laughs> but um, but you know, when you have an agenda to teach a course, you have to have a little bit of preparation. Well, this person just over-prepared because she was so nervous about getting it perfect. And then she'd gathered a group of people together and they were all arriving and she was bustling around and getting everyone settled and uh, everything like that. And uh, very nervous and went and sat down in front of the, of the group and realized she didn't have her teacher guide. She left it at home. Her map, her, her, her script for the day, so to speak, the first time she was teaching. And she immediately just started inside beating herself up. 
oh, what an idiot I am. I should, I'm such an imposter. I should never be here. I'm no good at this. I'm, I'm stupid. I'm forgetful, whatever it is that she said to herself. And then she gave, she recognized what was happening and she gave herself some compassion and, and took a breath and, and uh, got the class started. She just didn't have any choice. And she had the great wisdom to very shortly tell the, the group what happened. Hey, I was all prepared. I'd left my book at home. I just started to beat myself up. And then I just took a breath and I said, oh dear, this is hard. Um, and this isn't about self-compassion per se, except to say that her willingness to be transparent had such an impact on that group. They literally could not stop talking about her willingness to share what she had gone through. Like for weeks afterwards, it still kept coming up in the course. It was the best lesson in self-compassion one could get because she was willing to not pretend like, you know, everything's fine. You know, the duck on the water that's paddling furiously below the, below the surface. Uh, none of that was going on. And I just, that's always sort of stood out for me as just this, um, a beautiful example of where our willingness to meet what's here and to share that to some degree with our students, our trainees, our participants, uh, is perhaps one of the more powerful things we do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, well said. Thanks for sharing that with us. And, you know, I mentioned my father. Um, I'd really like to shift a little bit to unpacking your journey through uh, mentioning and asking you about a woman who I came to know and love very dearly, um, your mother, Fran, mm. and her influence on you as she was a therapist. I don't know, actually, so I'm quite curious if that had an influence on your path. And maybe sharing some of the gems that she would always <laughs> give us. That turned out to be incredibly profound teachings. Hmm. <laughs> ah. Well, you asked me if I was ready. I wasn't quite ready for that. So, yeah. But that's Good. okay. I am ready. I'm happy about that. Yeah. 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 Mom, Fran. Mm -hmm. Um. The big, tender, warm heart I got from her. Uh, you know, I got it from both my parents, but I lost my dad when I was 12, so I didn't have as much opportunity. Um, a great sense of humor that I... Uh, it's part of the transparency thing. Like, everyone here who knows me knows that uh, humor is a part of how I teach. And uh, some of that I learned from folks in this room as well, too. So um, yeah, it's interesting that uh, my two siblings were both police officers and my mom was a counselor therapist for many years. And um, those are sort of in, in some ways helpers on, on one end of the spectrum, but also different kinds of helpers on opposite ends of the spectrum in some ways. And, um, but what am I trying to say? Well, my favorite mom wisdom uh, has to do with how we contend with anxiety, which is when we get anxious, uh, I can see a couple of flickers of recognition already in the room. She taught me, breathe in, breathe out, and don't fuck with the sequence. So very helpful advice. Um, probably not something you can offer in your MSC or MBSR class or whatever, but um, there's something uh, right to the point about that. You know, it just came to mind was she used to have a little sign on her desk that I think has, has kind of guided me too. She, it said, um, People change not when they see the light, but when they feel the heat. I've always appreciated that because I think this is what we're doing. You know, we get we can get into the classroom, so to speak. We can get in front of a group of people and we can find ourselves teaching, you know, at them. Um, 
not practicing with them. And, you know, light bulbs can go off and you kind of think you're making some kind of progress. And, you know, you're called a teacher, so you must be uh, called upon to teach. Um, and there's something about being thrust into the front of the room or the top of the screen or whatever it is that makes you act like a teacher in the stereotypical form. And um, man, for all of the people that I've mentored, including a couple in this room, we've often spent a lot of time about not being a teacher <laughs> in a way, or at least that kind of a teacher, because nothing really happens when that light bulb goes off. I mean, maybe something happens. But the really important stuff happens when the heat, when we feel the heat, when we actually, when the rubber meets the road, when we're actually in the practice, right? Um, and, it, and that part doesn't have words. It doesn't, uh, there's no concepts. You know, the concepts are the finger pointing at the moon, right? You know, um, and we, but we forget that when we're new and then we remember eventually. When we do remember and we let go of all of that teaching at folks and we practice with them and we invite them into experiences and we hold them in the midst of those experiences and let them have their real learning, that's when the good stuff happens. It's way easier, it's way more fun for us as teachers. It's way more fruitful for the people. Uh, th there was one other piece about mom who mm -hmm. I, the world lost a little mm -hmm. over a year ago. So I still feel the, her presence and the pain of loss and grief. You know, even in her later days when she didn't even recognize us, she had dementia, um, she would get extremely distressed because she wanted to be, there were so many people that needed help. That way, I mean, she would say that like, I have to go, I have to, I have to help, I have to do something for these people. It was so ingrained in her that beyond the specifics of her own family members and who she recognized and what she remembered about that, there was this driving force to, to be of help. Um, and, um, but I would just kind of add to that again, sort of riffing just a little bit. If we are motivated out of just helping others like that, it sounds really good, but uh, it's also a recipe for burnout. If we aren't also holding ourselves in that, if we aren't tending to ourselves with care, with um, filling our own tank so that we can continue to, you know, help fill others. Um, but anyway, without kind of going on too long about that, I, I was just so struck uh, the last time that I got to spend time with my mom that that was, I, I felt so badly for her because she was uh, distressed about wanting to be helpful and, and not wanting to just rest. Um, but the fact that that carried through her uh, and is maybe acting in me in a certain kind of a way, uh, it just helps me to feel that she's present with me, I guess. And um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, beautiful. The, the only thing I would disagree with you is that you can say, breathe in breathe out <laughs> and don't fuck with the process in your groups because yeah I, i've said it so <laughs> <laughs> um well she was a beautiful woman and um is missed and also had that other great piece of advice which is just ask yourself where your feet mm. are right now yeah yeah, where are my feet? Yeah. It was there a moment in your childhood when you kind of felt you might be on a path of hmm. being with others in the way that it's evolved now? You know, the funny thing is, uh, <clears throat> no, <laughs> on the one hand. Yeah. Um, and... Um, 
I was a very, I still am, but I was then even more so shy person, um, introverted person. The idea of a job or a role that was interpersonal, that involved other people, was strangely uh, uncomfortable to me, the idea of it. And, you know, without, I don't want to sort of like pick apart my psyche here, and I don't know what that was all about, but I never pictured myself in an interpersonal role. You know what, when things flipped, is that when I considered, so I had considered clinical psychology, but then again, thought, oh, you know, like sitting, you know, working with other people in a kind of interpersonal way and doing therapy or whatever. I just seemed to, felt too shy and awkward to do that. Um, but my curiosity got the better of me. And I think that's what kind of carried me through was more about curiosity about other people and um, a kind of warm curiosity. Uh, actually, I, um, I remember an interview in, uh, for, for graduate school. I interviewed with a psychologist. At the time, I had a particular interest in police psychology because my siblings were both police officers and the work just struck me as so needing attention of mental health in general and support and and all of the rest. Uh, and the person who interviewed me had some experience in, in working with police officers. And, uh, and he said, you know, why do you want to go to graduate school? And I said, really, because I'm just intensely curious about people and how they work. And he knew that I had this interest in the police psychology. And he said, he had this big sigh and I couldn't tell what the sigh meant. I didn't know if it like I just failed the interview because I didn't say I wanted to help people or that he liked it, I couldn't tell. Uh, and he said, I'm so glad that you said that. And he said, because most everyone says, you know, you know, when you want to, why do you want to be a psychologist? Because I want to help people. And he said, he says, that for psychology is the same as it is for police work. If that's why you want to do, if that's your driving motivation, it's a recipe for burnout uh, and dissatisfaction and all the rest. Not to say that you aren't helping people, but if that is your primary motivation. Uh, and I think what he was actually speaking to was, a, was if that's what you're trying to always do, um, you set yourself up for feeling fairly powerless sometimes, like now, you know, like what I've just been talking about is powerlessness to some degree. Um, and how do we find our way back into a sense of uh, if not power, at least presence. So, so intense curiosity <laughs> about people and what makes them tick and maybe watching my mom working with clients and she was a kindergarten teacher before that and I have a certain amount of curiosity uh, as to how, uh, how anybody can do that particular job, but that's a sort of separate topic altogether. Yeah. So great that people do, but uh, curiosity. And, and I still, I have that today curiosity and not like an intellectual curiosity really for me. Uh, I, I'm going to tell a story about Alan. So uh, we were teaching MBSR together and um, uh, and this, uh, I don't remember the, the exact things. This is, I tell the story now and then just because I think it's, it captures this curiosity thing. Some of you may have actually heard me say it. We came out of the session. I had just been inquiring with someone and I was, I was just, I, cause I'm fascinated. Like I don't, you know, when we say, well, what did you notice after a practice? I always tell mentees this all the time. You know, you never know what's gonna come out of anybody's mouth when you ask that question. But when you're brand new to this, as some of you will remember, you think that you should be prepared for all possibilities. Like you should have a mental flow chart that like, well, okay, if they say this, it's this, and if it's this, it's that. And, and so you're freaking out because you don't know the flow chart because there is no flow chart and you, you don't know what to say and you feel like you have to be prepared. And then at some point over time, you recognize that when you ask that question, you don't have to know the answer. You don't have to have a flow chart. If your presence is there, if your attention is there, you will respond to what is shared. So anyway, so I, did, I never know what's gonna come out of someone's mouth and I can't wait to hear. And so, so we, we, we had this interact, I had this interaction, some kind of inquiry where I was sort of intensely curious and we went through the whole thing and then the session was over and, and uh, Alan said to me something like, you know, he says, you're just amazing. He says, 
you always seem so interested in what people are saying. And I said, well, I don't, I don't think I seem to be interested. I actually am interested or, or you act so interested. I think that was what you said. And I know we knew what you meant and you didn't really mean it the way it sounded, but I use that as an example, you know, like that I, I'm fascinated. Like I really am curious. And so just to kind of build on that just a little bit, I used to think many of you I know um, learned or have been taught by um, Florence Melio Meyer who has this beautiful presence and fascination with people and delight in what they have to say. And, uh, and at, in the early days, I didn't really understand that delight. I thought it was sort of contrived or sort of like cute or something like that. And then I really came to realize that it was this same quality of just like, instead of the terror we have when we don't know what's gonna come out of their mouth, we have delight. Oh, wow. You know, like just that simple thing that I, you know, I reacted in this way, or this came up, or I worked with something in this particular way. It's fascinating to me. And it never, you know, the fascination never ends. Curiosity and fascination uh, keeps me going. When you brought up graduate school, I happen to be privileged to know that you wrote your uh, dissertation on PTSD. Mm. Uh, it triggers a question for me about the state we're in now coming out of a pandemic and uh, the things going on in the world that you mentioned earlier. Any thoughts on, on that kind of trauma and how it's collective? I think we're all building spaces to contend with trauma in the work that we do together. Um, when I, uh, my dissertation without getting into the details focused on a particular kind of treatment for PTSD called prolonged exposure. It's still used in a lot of circles where essentially a person with a traumatic experience with PTSD would recount in, in real time in first person, the trauma story, sort of literally from, from beginning to end over and over and over again in the context of, a, of the therapeutic alliance in the space together. Um, and it sounds horrendous, and it is incredibly painful and difficult, but there is some evidence that it can be helpful. Um, but, and I didn't know, I didn't even know what mindfulness was when I was doing this. And I've gone back and looked at my dissertation and realized it had mindfulness all over it, but it didn't have any of it in it, in the sense that that word didn't, uh, wasn't there. Um, but what, but what was happening there was that I was, as the therapist, creating a safe space, uh, a grounded space, a mindful space, whatever you want to call it, and inviting a person to have an experience of presence while catching the thread of things that were in the past uh, and, and feeling pulled back and having a body react as if something was the traumatic experience was happening in the moment when in fact it wasn't, it was in, it was a memory. And without getting into a lot of theory and everything, I think what was happening was it was helping up, helping people ground themselves in the present moment and to sort out what's present and what isn't, which is, I don't know, looks, sounds to me like what we already do. Uh, and that there was something healing in that. Um, something hugely healing. And it was still giving space to the reality of a memory. In other words, that a memory was here, that suffering and pain were here, that anxiety was here, fear was here, and holding that with kindness, being willing to be present and to not resist and to allow, accept, comfort and soothe to some degree. Um, so, so I think when we create a space, a virtual space or a real space to teach MBSR, MBCT, MSC, whatever, um, we're doing that on a regular basis for everyone. We're creating a safe space that doesn't deny the reality of pain and suffering in the world and in our hearts, but allows for it, <coughs> uh, and meets it with presence and kindness. 
So, um, yeah. So we, you know, are we clinically treating PTSD? Probably not necessarily, but we're certainly creating a place for healing to happen or a path to begin or to continue or something like that. Um, and, you know, just to say a little bit more about creating safe spaces, um, in the MSC program, we speak to it more explicitly. In MBSR, it's a little less explicit. Um, but there is something about people being able to come together like this to share the common humanity, like I said, that is uh, healing. And I actually think, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you are teaching online. I'd be curious to know what your experience is about um, I think that maybe as frustrating and unsatisfying as it can be on the one hand to teach a group of people online in front of a computer screen rather than in the same space, I think when you've got a room full of people who don't have to fight traffic, <laughs> who uh, don't have to get childcare, don't necessarily have to take time off from work, only need to wander down the hall in their bunny slippers and sit down at the computer, uh, means that they're less activated to begin with, right from the beginning, that physiologically, they may be more receptive and more open, even though, you know, it's the same curriculum, so to speak. And then maybe we're having even a bigger effect, because people can learn this practice in in safe surroundings we don't even have we, we create a certain amount of it on the screen and in the group but also one has that each individual has that in their own space they found a space that at least was protected for two and a half hours where they could feel some degree of ease and safety and and maybe receive what they could receive in a less aroused state. So I'd love somebody someday to study that because I think maybe we're even having more impact, not to mention the fact that we can reach so many more people this way. Glad we're here because I want to circle back to this when we get to the going to Mars view towards <laughs> the end of our session. We're already well above the 40,000 foot view, so <laughs> we're going to have to go to Mars. Um, so when does mindfulness appear? that word and that uh, move into the field? How did we get to the Center for Mindfulness, I guess would be Oh, okay. I see, you're question. being a little less esoteric, a little more concrete. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I had this, the honor and privilege and frustration and struggle of working with uh, patients from the UC San Diego pain clinic being referred to me as a psychologist, at first I was just doing assessment uh, for the pain clinic to help them sort out people's issues or challenges. Um, and then what we recommended for everyone was some form of treatment therapy, whatever it might be. And I wasn't in a position to provide it at first. And then I was, and um, talk about powerlessness. It was how I felt with people like, well, I'm a psychologist. I, uh, psychologist I have no training in like how to treat you know back pain or whatever kind of pain um and a certain amount of frustration and even when I talked talked with psychologist colleagues they you know they were like oh my god I can't believe you work with chronic pain patients you know they're the worst you know which is really not the kind of thing therapists should be saying about people but nonetheless that came out sometimes because and I think what was happening was tapping into their sense of powerlessness. Well, I can't help them because they have a physiological problem and I'm not, that's not my department, so to speak. Um, so without kind of unt untangling the whole thing, um, I heard about this thing, mindfulness. I actually got dragged to a lecture by this guy I'd never heard of named John Kabat-Zinn doing a grand rounds at UCS, UCSD and uh, must have been about 1995. Uh, I went because my boss told me to go, not because I felt inclined to go. And uh, he talked about all this meditation and yoga stuff. And I just sat through it. And um, then fast forward about eight, nine years, and I actually got a chance to introduce him 
giving a talk in that very same auditorium. Um, but the point being that when I, um, there was something over time that said to me, oh, like mindfulness, this capacity to be present with things as they are, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, might be something that would be helpful to these people. So I, I think without kind of getting mired in the details, when I could sit with somebody and feel as if there was something I had to offer them, mindfulness, that they had come to the right place, regardless of what their specific story was, was when the powerlessness kind of poof, kind of disappeared. I could like sit there with a new person who came and sat down with me and said, I have this in that condition or, um, you know, whatever it might be. And I felt like I could truly say you came to the right place. Like that there, I do have something to offer. This practice is something that can benefit you in your particular situation. And frankly, it didn't matter what their situation was. It was something that I could meet them with that, that was potentially beneficial to them. Yeah, so here we are back at powerlessness again, like that went out the window. And the, the, the fact that no matter who showed up at my doorstep, doorstep, I had something to offer that they probably hadn't encountered before formally and could benefit from was, was kind of a, a big shift and led to me to be more enthusiastic about it and want to create a center and things like that. But just those those moments, and, and some of you have, have heard me tell this particular story. One of the first people that had been referred to me by the pain clinic that I was able to meet with mindfulness and to invite into an MBSR class was this uh, tough guy. Um, it's probably in his 60s at the time. And um, he, he came to uh, basically had a lot of neck and back and upper extremity pain had had multiple surgeries had had an accident on the job and and complicated it with another fall and he had a lot of pain a lot of depression very uh just des desperate and um i talked him into taking one of my first couple of mbsr courses and he went because uh, he was willing to try anything so he was desperate um and he had this kind of breakthrough about four or five sessions in. And he said to the group at the time, he said, I'm, I'm a tough guy. You've kind of figured that out. I grew up in Detroit. You know, there's a tough neighborhood. He says, and I learned how to fight to succeed. And he said, I, I, um, you know, I had to get in fights to get what I wanted with the neighborhood bullies and kids on the street. And, so then I joined the wrestling team and I fought my way to the top of my weight class. Uh, and then I played football and I, my coach just taught me how to fight through pain and injury. And he said, you know, I was always like busted up and bleeding, but sent back into the game. And I just fought myself my way through it all. And he said, and then I fought my way to the top of my career. And then I had this injury and then I had this chronic pain and I've been fighting with this chronic pain for like 10 years and I'm losing a lot, but I'm fighting. And he said, what I finally learned in this class was that it was possible for me to dance with the pain. Hmm. And um, that shift, like I just say that, like to pause and to think about what is the difference between fighting with it and dancing with it. Both parties are still there, but there is a kind of ease and flow and rhythm that in the dancing that isn't there in the fighting and when you can feel that in your body like that's it and for him that was everything and for a lot of folks i think that shift is what keeps us coming back for more when people can find a way to dance with what they have rather than fight with it and if you have ever tried as a teacher to ask somebody hey just dance with your pain that doesn't work. <laughs> like if it has, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. But uh, yeah, that's sort of like saying just accept it, right? You know, like that's always a big winner as well. So there was something about having invited him into this experience that allowed him to discover for himself that he could dance with the pain rather than fight with it. And that his success or his ease or his freedom 
was not found in getting rid of the pain or resisting it, but actually in coming to a different relationship with it. I mean, that's been like a guiding thing for me ever since. Um, and like I said, the challenge is how one invites that to happen, creates its causes and conditions for that to happen uh, experientially and not, not um, with words and not by telling people to just accept it or whatever it might be. One last little story that goes with that. Um, I had uh, another MBSR class where, um, I don't know, it was maybe the fifth session again or so that somebody, a guy came back into class and he was just, he was a savings and loan executive in the days when that was a really horrendous field to be in, a lot of banking problems and issues going on, a lot of stress, a lot of layoffs. He was totally stressed out. He lived alone, but he lived with, he had a number of uh, big like parrots or macaws or something like that. And um, he, he came in back into class, like I said, about fifth session, and he was just lit up and he was like, I just, you know, I got the whole, you know, earned the whole cost of admission just with one thing that happened this week. Like I've, I've gotten so much from this, just this one situation that I'm just like, he was like bubbling over. He had to share with everyone. And he said, you know, I sat down to do my meditation uh, one day this week. And as my, my birds are often uh, inclined to do when it gets really quiet, they start to squawk and make a lot of noise. And he, since I was sitting and I was meditating and it was going great, uh, which is a bit of a challenge all by itself. But then, and, she, and he said, and, and then the birds started squawking. And I thought to myself, I just wanna kill the birds. He said, and then I recognized that I was having a thought, I just wanna kill the birds. And it didn't mean I had to act on it. And for him, that was it. Like that, uh, being uh, having that decentering, whatever you want to call it, that he was able to see a thought that did not make it a fact, and he could let it go, and that he didn't have to actually get up and kill a bird, um, for him was everything. And again, it was, you know, could I have told him that? Of course not, but he found his way into it in a in a kind of a way that for him captured the whole thing, and that's the the magic of this, I guess, is um, is when we can help people have that felt sense of that uh, uh, re freedom, I guess. Personally, that was true for me with chronic pain. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's so important, if anything, these sessions uh, do to inspire new teachers and to give insight into what this is about. I hope they hear that little segment, that snippet of what you just said, because I think it's so ultimately important to recognize the experiential aspect of holding the space as opposed to, you know, Western style teaching. Hmm. Um, so there's so much, Steve, we could talk about in the growth of the UC San Diego Center for Mindfulness. Um, you know, I often have told my mentees that you are the center of your own center for <laughs> mindfulness. And the growth comes from the amount of time you spend on the cushion. And things happen around that as you're drawn to it, to practice and to opening to other people. You know, the beauty found within it of what you just described. So somehow you took it to new heights as kind of a pre professional executive director in a way and, <laughs> and uh, continued to create centers. So what would you like to say about anything UC San Diego orientated versus the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion? Um, the growth of those, or maybe even the uh, the way they might differ, or the way they're the same, hmm. you know, within the work that you've been doing. I think there's something about going back to the curiosity and um, 
not knowing. Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's even the sort of not knowing versus uncertainty um, piece. I didn't, didn't know what the center for mindfulness was going to be. I had ideas and then I just showed up and then you showed up and other people showed up. Um, I think there is something about showing up without expectation, you know, without, without a firm, uh, I don't want to say without a firm vision, but being open to possibility maybe is a better way of doing it. Like, I don't know why I have some inclination to create centers or to grow them. Uh, maybe I get lonely. I just want to have people around me. So I, you know, build it up. Uh, you know, actually, that's probably some truth to that. You know, I came back from my my first big experience of MBSR that I shared with you and Mike and Barbara here and a number of other people at a teacher development intensive back in the day, 2002, right? Right. Um, it's our 20th uh, anniversary. Maybe. That's right. Yeah, look at us. We're still going strong. Yeah. We still still look as young as ever, right? So I <laughs> yeah. have a little less hair. Okay. Barbara's is a little more purple than it was then, but you know. Um, but I came back like without getting into all of that. That was an awesome experience that changed my life for for certain. Um, but I came back wanting community, wanting sangha, and um, and so I think there is something about me wanting to create, not wanting to feel isolated and to, to connect with other people. I started out by finding other MBSR teachers in San Diego, thinking that would recreate what we created in Worcester in 2002. And then I realized you got to stop trying to recreate past experiences and just make new ones instead, uh, and then create a center, um, but without a, being attached to what it was going to be. So, um, and that actually was a lot of the joy when I when it started to be a thing and UCSD Center for Mindfulness, you know, had it, its identity and its mission and activities, uh, perhaps it got a little less interesting than it had because when it was wide open, it was just two guys wandering up and down the hall saying, what, what kind of mischief can we get into? And so I went to, to join uh, CMSC when it was very, very small. And the same was true, the sky was the limit and there was no particular roadmap. But it's the willingness to show up and to be open to whatever arises that's the theme, I think. Um, I, don't need to grow, I don't need to grow things. I don't need things to be huge. I, um, uh, I just like doing the work of whatever, in whatever form is possible. Um, and in growing the work and growing and connecting with the people like all of you here and the, all the people that I've worked with, uh, you know, uh, I think it was my 58th birthday or so that um, uh, our dear friend Alan was with us, with me at my house with a number of people and there may have been a beer or two involved. And uh, he said, uh, so Dr. Hickman, what's the, what's the meaning of life or what does it all mean? Uh, and um, it took me about 10 seconds to scramble and to come up with something that, that seemed, well, I wanted to come up with something that sounded wise and whatever. And what came out of me was in the end, it's all about the people. And that's kind of been with me ever since it, it is all about the people. It's funny, you know, here I was, I told you I was shy and I didn't want to do anything interpersonal. And, and now who knows how many people I've spoken to and touched in various, various ways. It is all about the people. I don't know why I was resisting that back then, but um, the chance to connect with people, to help people who are helping other people that's another piece, you know, I've been a teacher trainer for a long time. Uh, I've, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not really good at doing train, being trained, but I'm pretty good at training other people, strangely enough. Um, uh, that's a whole topic in and of itself, but I think a willingness to show up 
to be open to whatever arises and to follow a dream or follow a follow what is interesting, what moves you is huge. I, I, I had this vision when I, when I say that as a psychology trainee, I had a colleague who was at somewhat the same level and would come to meetings that we had every week at a particular internship site we, we were in, um, who was very focused on becoming a neuropsychologist. That was all she was interested in. She, knew, she wanted to do that from the beginning and that it was fine in a certain kind of way. I didn't know what I wanted to do as a psychologist and there's a zillion different things you could do. Um, but I kept coming to the meetings and we had speakers from all different walks of life in the psychology field. And she, I would see her literally shut down when it wasn't a neuropsychology related topic. And she would just be like, at that time, it wasn't so much people on their phones, but she was clearly distracted, not interested. And I never really understood that because I soaked it all up. Didn't mean I wanted to do all of it, but I think it served me well to just be open and to never know, to, to op open to not knowing and to be receptive and curious to whoever walked in the door and whatever opportunity came along and then to seize what moved me and let go of what didn't, which is just practicing mindfulness, I imagine. Um, get a little fast and loose with handing out titles that Alan and I share a penchant for doing. Yeah, well, we're gonna keep looking forward to more and more and more so that going to Mara's question and you know it's interesting because we've taught in the virtual world of second life mm. which was maybe one of if not the first metaverses and now metaverses are becoming uh, mm. something we're moving into rather than real life more and more and then we were contacted at the center um, by our colleagues, through our colleagues from that Second Life program about uh, doing some work for astronauts uh, training and on their way in spaceflight to Mars and how mindfulness might be utilized in certain ways. So literally going to Mars is here and then the question around that is, you know, where are we moving in terms, and we'll keep it simple to Zoom, let's say, scalability that Zoom provides, you know, accessibility. And the fact that I'm seeing in some ways people are maybe wanting to stay with it because they feel it is monetarily advantageous because it gives them a global reach to fill the seats. Um, so I guess just in general, without getting into my esoteric, as you framed it, nature here, where are we headed? What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, as I said, I'm not, I haven't been really good about uh, forming a, a vision to kind of pursue, but um, what I love about where we are, let's stick with that, mm -hmm. is this accessibility issue um, in terms of uh, diversity uh, in all ways, inclusion, um, affordability, access, all of those kinds of things. Is, I, I just think it's like a monumental step forward. At least we have seen that with, with the Mindful Self-Compassion Program uh, in terms of the diversity of participants geographically, ethnically, you know, every every kind of identity you can imagine. This is a great democratizer in a lot of ways, this online Zoom or whatever platform that makes this work so much more accessible on the one hand. Um, I do, I guess there's a part of me that even though I haven't taught in person for over two and a half years, probably close to two and a half years. Um, there is something missing <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that I think I have convinced myself, uh, well, not really spending too much time thinking about it, that uh, I've convinced myself that uh, it isn't necessarily necessary. You know, like I made that whole pitch about how maybe people are physiologically more receptive when they're online. But 
finding that mix, I would love to be able to return to that, to some degree of that magic that happens when we're gathered in a room together. Um, that is, yeah, you can't put your finger on it, really. Um, I, I, we have a whole crop of new teachers of mindful self-compassion that vir have virtually not encountered the practice or taught or learned to teach in person. Like mm -hmm. we're going to have to have a, a, like a special course on teaching in person at some point as people, some people go back to that. Um, but I think what, you know, what it becomes is that uh, it, the practice is the practice is the practice too, that um, these things will coexist. I, I don't think we're, you know, in the early days, I remember uh, thinking of the COVID thinking, well, you know, temporarily we'll kind of go to allowing people to teach online and we'll teach online for a while. And then as soon as this, you know, this pandemic passes by the end of the year in 2020 or whenever I thought it was going to happen, you know, we'll all just go wholesale back to the way it, way it was. And now we know that's not necessarily the case. Um, so maybe just the the fact that there will be variety of offerings. I, I just think there's been so much possibility around um, accessibility, not just to the course, but of training and training teachers and, um, and refining teaching. So uh, because there can be things like this and other opportunities for further deepening of training. You know, in the old days, there was no training, <laughs> you know, start with MBSR, there was no teacher training and people taught. And, and then, you know, things have evolved and in all these different programs, the path is different. But in a lot of cases, it was like, you go off to some sort of intensive training for five or six or seven days or whatever. And then you went on, then you were a teacher. And then there are now more steps and more steps. And, um, uh, you know, it, but the process of becoming a teacher is a process. It's not a, there's no destination. And so if there are easy ways of doing a workshop online on inquiry or on embodiment or on working with trauma or whatever it might be, these are, these are things that we can do that are not terribly expensive burdensome. People don't have to, you know, leave their job for a week and travel somewhere and pay for room and board and all of this kind of stuff, but can get really valuable training means that we can all be better at what we do, which is a good thing. So, so it's some sort of hybrid world, I guess, is what it amounts to. Yeah. I don't think the virtual world in the way I know of it and our experience of second life was the way, I mean, that was very, mm -hmm. it was very uh, kind of cool for a while. And then, it wasn't uh, because the coolness, cool, coolness factor wore off. And then you were basically interacting with a, a lot of people by way of a visual representation that wasn't them. You know, it was very impersonal, but maybe it was, we were pioneers in some other way. Yeah. But there is a big part of me that would love to be sitting in the same room with all of you in a circle or wherever in a pleasant setting. And, um, you know, dare I say it, breathing the same air um you know i'm i guess i'm old school that way yeah. well let's do that as best as we can on zoom here and shift to opening up the circle a little bit um anybody has any questions or wants to say hi or <laughs> you know we could take a few comments, questions, thoughts, Kalika. <laughs> I, I just, I just have so much gratitude, Steve, again, but sitting here and, and, and hearing you teach again, hearing your, your voice, everything that Alan said and, and the gentleness, you know, and it's not been a long time that I haven't spoken to you, but <laughs> You know, there's just something about the magic. And with the two of you, it's just making me, and there are times that my heart just wells up with so much gratitude. And just going back to, I just feel so um, fortunate, you know, and to have met your mom and to, and I just want to tell everybody that I, at one time, 
asked, I just said, you've done such, I mean, what you've done with this man, you know, and she, said, and she goes, he came in that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've taught me so much. You showed me so much. And, and when you started talking about your days of psychology and how you work with people, I mean, this just goes back, 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 back to another lifetime for me. So I'm just so gratitude. So I'm so gratitude. I'm so <laughs> grateful. And uh, Alan, I mean, the bliss and the fun and everything that went on with the two of you, you know, it's just another place. The center is just an absolute other place now than what we had. So thank you both from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you, Kalika. Thanks, uh, let's let's just check back with Mike and then we'll go to Rita. Mike. Oh yeah, I yeah. just uh, wanted to say thank you for uh, hosting this and uh, such a great chance to see you and Steve together. I Amen. didn't want to miss it. I should attend <laughs> more of these. Um, oh. uh, it, it's really, you know, talk about what do you need. You know, this sense of community is uh, really helpful. Uh, you know, with all the quarantine. But um, yeah. I did have a question for Steve. I was wondering, I remember his poem that he created, I think it was during the TDI and uh, uh, being an equanimous, first time <laughs> I'd heard that word. Uh, and too. I wondered if he's still, uh, if you're still writing uh, poetry and uh, maybe you could share a poem. Ah, um, well, if I could find that one, I'll, I'll bring it up. I have, you know, it's a funny thing. I've the poetry bug comes and goes for me. Uh, I was particularly inspired, I'd never written poetry before. And while we were all together, we uh, like something happened and um, and it came flowing out and uh, it hasn't happened as much lately. Um, but I will, let I me mean, just really quick, see if I can find the my poem. Actually, I'll, I'll come, I'll keep looking. Maybe we should go on and I'll see what I can do to find it. Thanks, Mike. Well, it's good, Thanks good for to see you. Good to see you, and uh, thank you, Alan, for making this happen. Appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome, Mike. And uh, you and everybody here are invited to sit for one of these uh, sessions. So maybe we'll have you back in the fall, Mike. Oh. I found it. Let me. Um, if you, uh, so yes. So our dear friend Scott. <laughs> treatment uh, actually used the word equanimous in our teacher development <laughs> intensive. I'd never heard that word before. And he made a comment in passing. I think this is what got the whole poetry train started. Uh, he said, uh, it was the equanimous, everyone questioned whether it was a word and he said something about it. He thought it was a word and it was the only word that rhymed with equanimous or with uh, hippopotamus. And so that's where the hippo poem came from. So I'll just share the, the poem because uh, I entitled it The Hippo for Scott. The hippo floats in swamp serene, some emerged but most unseen, seeing all and only blinking, who knows what this beast is thinking, gliding and of judgment clear, letting go and being here, seeing all both guilt and glory, only noting, but that's my story. I sit here hippo-like and breathe, while inside I storm and seethe. Would that I were half equanimous as that placid hippopotamus. In case anyone Thank you. wants. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for reading that, Steve. We've had so much fun with that over the years. Uh, Rita, let's go to you. Rita. Let's see. There we go. There we yeah. go. You hear me? Yep. Yeah. Olá, Steven. Good to see you again. You remember me, Steve? Of course I do. How could I forget? You know, this is very, very special today because uh, I was not planning to be here. I I wanted to be here, but I, I've been the moving process from one place to the other. And today, this morning, I was unpacking my my things. And what I found 
the, my diploma from our teacher training <laughs> from Marcelo's in Portugal, if you guys don't know, but they, those both blessings here, Alan and Steven, <laughs> they, were, they were in my teacher training. Uh, so that was like a big sign for me. I said, I have, <laughs> so I cancel what I have to do. I said, I have to be there. So thank you for allowing me to be here present with you. Mm. And what a blessing to have you guys, all the group, but today is special, both of you, because brings that memory and memory is life. And I, I'm, I just living again, the moment that we were together in Barcelos. Uh, mm. So it's really, really a, a blessing. And I, I'm very, every day that I get here in this, our community, I feel like it's me. It's what I, it's my process is I started with you guys and I, you know, taking my own rhythm, uh, slow, but always. And I, I feel like every time that I join you here, I say, this is me. This, this is what I, what I meant to be. Uh, so I'm very glad to feel, to have that feeling and to, to share that with you guys. And all the topics today, they were amazing, including mm. moms, uh, dads, <laughs> and the process of uh, learning that uh, teaching is a process. All this fits so much for my life that I'm not going to get into details, but uh, fits a lot in my life. So uh, it's a blessing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Obrigada. Mm. Obrigada, Rita. Thank, thank you, Rita. Rita. Ah, fond memories. Yeah. Yeah, Paolo. Okay, here we go. I... Okay, I was muted. Yeah. First of all, many, many thanks for this uh, conversation because it was uh, super interesting and uh, very, very full of uh, great uh, insights and, and information. And sorry for my English because I'm an Italian mindfulness teacher. For sure, you know my um, my teachers as well, Alessandro, Gian Andrea, and uh, Raffaella Pagnanini. So, yes. <laughs> so they, they were the link for me to connecting with, with you. And uh, so um, my question that is more a topic I'm interested in, in, in at this moment, uh, and it's, it's something I discovered from uh, Alessandro's um, we, uh, for my mentorship with uh, Alessandro is the topic of, uh, um, uh, let's say, the idea of uh, reality as uh, an illusion and uh, the idea of uh, connecting to um, the concept of living, uh, uh, let's say, not an illusion, but a, a construction of uh, the mind. So my uh, I, my curiosity was just to know maybe a few words uh, shortly how um, this relates to teaching uh, mindfulness to teach MBSR because I, I think it's a very uh, it's a very interesting topic for for a mindfulness practitioner and uh, and a teacher and this is very important so sometimes I think when I teach a, a concept or a simple exercise that uh, the big uh, the bigger picture is some something about more the way we relate to reality. So <laughs> I just want to know a little bit from you, Alan and Steve, <laughs> what do you think about this a, a very giant topic? Yeah. <laughs> and thanks again. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I can tell that has uh, roots in <laughs> Alessandro for sure. I can see Alan laughing. Uh, uh, yeah, because we could spend a few hours or days on that topic. But, uh, uh, you know, he and I did actually chat about this recently. And I think, uh, I hope he's going to be one of your guests, by the way, Alan. He, he is. I okay. don't remember the exact date right now, but it's coming okay. up in the summer series. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think what part, you know, to keep it short, I think what's most important for us as teachers is, is again, like this what we're teaching is non-conceptual. And, and when we, when we and every, everything that we're doing, I think, I, I've sometimes said like, you know, when you ask somebody uh, at the end of a meditation, so what did you notice? It's almost like, so someone had a particular experience in a meditation and it's like at the very center of a bullseye, like whatever unfolded for them, maybe they just were aware of their heartbeat you know, their heart racing just a bit and their face flushing, 
and a thought that came up and emotion that came up like that, whatever it was, like is the center of the bullseye. And so when we ask, so what did you notice? They take that experience and they translate it into to words. So they have a memory of it and then they translate it into words. So it becomes a little more removed and, and they say those words out loud and then I hear them and then I translate those words into thoughts and it becomes even a, the bigger circle. And then I try to uh, respond to it. And if I respond to it like, oh, it seems as if you really struggled with that and uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if I got too cut conceptual. I'm so far from reality because it's been translated through so many different layers that our job as teachers, I think, is always to drive back to the center of that experience. So the less that I try to parrot back what they say, and the more that I inquire into, oh, you know, without having to understand what happened, but to take them back to, oh, so, so, wow, that's fascinating. So what happened next? So tell me more about that, or or how did how did you work with that, or whatever it might be, is all in the services of going back to the center of the bullseye, and not trying to filter it through my experience and their words and my words and all of the rest. And I think what we're doing is keeping it real, <laughs> you know, so to speak, or connecting it more closely to you know not a construction of what reality is, but the actual actuality of it that's it in the end is when we can keep people as close to their experience as we possibly can with a little bit of framework we're doing their best work and we don't have to kind of turn it into a whole philosophical thing about reality and constructed reality and all of the rest but if we're always remembering to go back to that like zooming in i'm a big fan as my mentees know of zooming in on the person's actual experience because when we do a meditation in a course it's a training run. It's nothing more than that. It's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's really a chance to invite people to have a certain kind of experience so that they ultimately want to continue having that kind of experience or that kind of approach to their experience. We don't have to squeeze the juice out of one particular meditation and turn it into some co concept about beginner's mind or resistance or anything else. We just want people to have the experience so that they continue to reference that experience and to re-engage with their moments, moment by moment, and that's it. So if we remember that, then we stay out of the weeds of concepts and ideas and constructed realities and you know all of that, perceptions. Um, so anyway, without kind of going on too long, I think driving to the center of the bullseye is what it's all about. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Right. Helpful for me, and I saw a lot of other heads nodding. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think at this point we're going to um, pause our recording, and I just want to thank uh, Steve publicly here within this recording for joining us. Um, so much wisdom that you were able to give us through the history and stories and recollections of your life and your path. So great mm -hmm. gratitude for that, Steve. And if anybody was inspired who's watching this in the future or today and watching it in the future, we're uh, supported by our community. So there will be a link at the bottom of this recording if you would like to make a contribution of any amount to help support this vision of kind of cataloging these insights of mindfulness teachers like Steve's today. So again, thank you, Steve. It's so great. Uh, My pleasure. Great appreciation. A heartfelt thanks. Click down below to join our Mindfulness Teacher Community Facebook group, where you're also invited to post and share. Also, subscribe to Sing to the Mountain Studio so you don't miss out on future recordings of live sessions. Mm -hmm.